Good morning. So imagine with me for a second. You're handed a delicious, round, and soft fried dessert. It has a hole in it, it has a hint of vanilla, and a thin coating of shiny sweetness. And it's the most magical thing you've ever had in your life. Now also imagine the person who gave it to you is long gone, and they didn't leave with you the word to describe it. And so you spend your life searching for this delicious treat. And everyone that you encounter, you describe the exact same thing. It's round, it's brown, it has a hole in it. And so you probably are gonna end up with a lot of bagels. And the thing is, bagels are great, right? Bagels are delicious. And I have nothing against bagels, but this thing that you've been searching for, this thing is different, it's special. And in fact, it's so special that you spend a lifetime trying to come up with a word to describe it. And then one day, you happen behind a store display. And on that store display is a screen. And on that screen is this picture and this word. So first of all, two feelings. One is you're elated. You've finally been reintroduced to your long lost love, right? And then there's this other thing that's up there. This thing that seems kind of familiar, but yet doesn't make any sense. Do not or excuse me, donut, or is it do nut? But it means nothing to you, but yet it's familiar. Why does it do, or is it supposed to be dough, but why not spell it with D-O-U-G-H? And yes, I do have a problem with the way that we spell donut. Um, but it also has no nuts in it. So the thing that you had that you've been describing all these years was a delicious piece of fried dough. It had nothing to do with nuts. It wasn't nut-shaped, if we think about the hardware, but yet we use this word to describe something, and yet we expect people to understand what it is. And this, my friends, is a metaphor for how I almost never found my own passion and my own career, which is donuts. No, actually, it's industrial design. So I'm an industrial designer. I also have a master's in biomedical, I mean, excuse me, in art education. I design museum exhibits, and I teach biomedical engineers at one of the most prestigious universities in the country. So, out of a show of hands in the audience, and it's hard for me to see you, how many of you know what industrial design is? One, two, okay, looks like maybe four of you. Five, six, and maybe I can see over there. So, of the people that raised your hand, how many would be willing to stand on this stage and tell the rest of this audience what industrial designers do. Okay, so nobody. All right, so you notice that I did not raise my hand. Um, I've been an industrial designer for 15 years, and I've actually been teaching young designers about this process for the last 12 years, and yet I'm reluctant to stand on this stage and tell you what industrial design is because it's hard to describe. But what I can tell you is what industrial design is not. It is not the design of factories. <laughs> All right, so for me, when people ask me what I do or what industrial design is, I start by describing what I do and the process that I use. So I'm a creative problem solver, and what I do is I try to tackle problems on a human scale. I, every day I use science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics in order to understand how to make people's lives better. So simply put, industrial designers use STEAM to research and understand the world's problems in order to design products to better solve those problems. And products that you guys are surrounded by every day. So for those of you who don't think you know what industrial design is, in fact, you do. In fact, you're holding it in your hand. It's that cell phone you just put into silent mode. It's the chair that you're sitting in. It's the shoes on your feet. It's the car that you drove here on. It's the medical devices that save lives every day. It's the toys that we grew up playing with. So how did I, as a young girl from Valdosta, Georgia, discover industrial design? Well, the thing is, I didn't until I was in college. If you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was in high school, I would have told you I wanted to be an engineer. But in fact, I didn't really know what engineers did. But kind of like that bagel, it seemed like a close approximation. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to solve problems. I wanted to make stuff. And I wanted to be creative. And engineering seemed like a good fit. 
But it turns out that what I wanted to do wasn't quite engineering. And I knew this from an early age, thanks to a 1988 movie called Big. And Big is a movie in which Tom Hanks would play what I would argue is one of his most important roles. So if those of you who are unfamiliar with Big, let me introduce you to 12-year-old Josh Baskins. Josh is fed up with being a kid. So one day he goes to a carnival and he makes a wish on the Zoltar wishing machine. Zoltar grants his wish. The next morning he wakes up in the body of 30-year-old Tom Hanks. And of course, no one believes him. So he does what all kids do in the 80s. He runs off to the big city and becomes the vice president of product development for a toy company, falls in love with Elizabeth Perkins, and ends up becoming a kid again. So the scene that most people remember from Big is when he goes to FAO Schwartz and plays heart and soul on a huge keyboard with his boss. And that's awesome. Who doesn't want to do that? But that wasn't the scene that stuck out to me. What stuck out to me was a much different scene. It was a scene with a product researcher running down the hallway with a gaggle of kids into a product testing room where she would proceed to be beat up by huge, enormous boxing gloves. But this scene was my glimpse behind the scenes of what, it went, what people go through in order to create products and devices for people. The fact that you would try to better understand how someone could use something in order to improve that product. This glimpse behind the scenes of product development and toy making is how I decided what I wanted to be when I grew up. I really wanted to be Tom Hanks. No, actually, I wanted to be a product developer. I wanted to make toys. Now, if you had asked me before I saw Big what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told you I wanted to be a first grade teacher or a second grade teacher or a ballerina or a Girl Scout troop leader or maybe even a veterinarian. But you see where I'm going with this. All the roles that I imagined were the things that I were exposed to. Now, growing up in a small town, there was a distinct lack of diversity in the fields in career roles that I had, a, had exposure to. So what I had to do was sort of piece together these role models based on what I saw on television. Now, if television could have such a profound effect on what I saw as my career, how else had it affected my life? And I grew up watching a lot of television. In fact, I grew up watching a lot of public television. And on public television, I was introduced to a lot of things that influence who I am today. And I would largely argue that without seeing some of those things, I would not be standing in front of you talking about industrial design. So the first person I want to introduce you to is Anne Shirley. So Anne of Green Gables was a miniseries that would come on during PBS telethons. And Anne introduced me to someone who was brave, confident, loved to learn, and was a fierce and loyal friend. But it wasn't just Anne Shirley on public television that introduced me to all these wonderful things. Bob Ross introduced me to painting and fine art. Bob Vila and This Old House taught me about craftsmanship, and, and I fell in love with the idea of having power tools in my own shop one day. And it wasn't just public television. So network shows were great, too. So those of you that grew up watching The Cosby Show remember Claire Huxtable. She was smart, she was successful, and she was witty, and she was one of those people who had it all. And then there was Angela Bauer, who had her own advertising firm, who taught me that it was I, actually okay for me to dream to be the boss. And it wasn't just these women role models as well. Science fiction had a large part to play. Watching sci-fi and superhero shows with my parents, I actually nurtured my inner geek. Cartoons like the Jetsons taught me to imagine a future where our life was automated, commuting was fun, and robots had personalities. Star Trek allowed me to imagine a world where we had gadgets and devices that would allow us to travel through space and time in ways that we're still trying to figure out how to do today. Superhero shows like Wonder Woman inspired me to fight for the underdog and inspired my sense of courage, justice, and Amazonian strength. And it was probably shows like The Bionic Woman, which was a reboot when I was watching it, that taught me that we actually have the power, we actually have the technology to turn people into superheroes. And let's face it, there's probably not a cooking show that I ever hated. So. When we think about these profound influences that TV has on my life, we're not just talking about me wanting to be a toy maker like Tom Hanks. 
What we're really talking about is leveling the playing field. See, television allowed me a glimpse into worlds and lives that I otherwise would not have had access to. I was able to model my life after role models and the lives that they showed on TV, and I was able to piece together a career, a career that finally led me to engineering and then to industrial design. So, we ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, and adults as well. Oftentimes, they have this picture in their head, this description, but they don't often have the words to describe what they want to do. And if we think about the future, a lot of the jobs that they're going to be applying for don't exist yet. So if you don't have the vocabulary, what do you have? Well, when we're talking about groups like underrepresented minorities, or underserved populations, or isolated communities, or small communities like the one I grew up in, it's not just a matter of vocabulary, it's also a matter of access. It's a matter of access to the diversity of different careers and different professionals in the world that allow you to imagine a world beyond what they do. And so, when we think about ways to solve this, oftentimes we default to mentorship programs or role model programs. And while these things are great and they are largely successful, they don't reach everyone. But you know what does? TV. Televisions, movies, and computer screens around the country are reaching audiences young and old. They're giving them a glimpse into the lives, the lifestyles, the careers, the jobs, and the futures that they are unaware of and have not yet imagined. And I think it's wonderful, but I think that we could do more. So I would actually like to call for greater diversity in what we see on TV. Um, if you want to go into the criminal justice system or the healthcare field, there's probably a cop show, doctor show, or lawyer show out there for you. But what if you were a kid like me? What if you wanted to solve the world's problems, but you didn't want to necessarily fight crime? Where are my shows? Now, yes, there are a couple of them out there, but I would argue that we could have more. I think if we really want to encourage underrepresented minorities, people from small communities, women, and a diversity of people to get involved in STEM and STEAM, what we really need to do is develop well-formed characters and well-formed stories which show a diversity of people from different genders, backgrounds, races, religions, and socioeconomic statuses solving the world's problems. And it probably wouldn't hurt to throw in a few donuts. Thank you. <laughs>